Good morning. It is a beautiful day. Thank God for such a another day. Every day is a great blessing from God. I ask you to share, if you will, start watch parties, call a friend, relative, associate, and a neighbor, and tell them that we are broadcasting from Facebook Live. I am so honored uh, to be able to serve two of God's greatest churches, which I say redundantly, uh, the Good Sale United Methodist Church, as well as the Power Chapel United Methodist Church. And I just thank God that for such a great opportunity. And let me just direct you to a word I think a very timely word for the times in which we are living in, since there's so much uncertainty and so much suffering that is taking place. I want to look at a word from the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter. And the Sixth verse. The sixth verse says, Then he said to me, All is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I want to talk with you this morning from the subject God is still in charge. God is still in charge. When you have faith, you, you don't have to worry, Barbara. You don't have to worry, Christy. You don't have to worry, Mary. You don't have to worry, Tiana. You don't have to worry, Lee, because if the world blows up, when all of the dust settles, you know that God will still be in charge. There are some folks who have worried themselves to death over silly and mundane things. Some folks have worried themselves to death about people who won't do right to save their souls. And they are still here. And the person that worried about them has long been dead and gone. The great theologian H. Richard Niebuhr wrote a prayer called the Serenity Prayer, Julia. It says, Lord, give me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change and to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. But, Katina, I uh, met... Angela Davis, the great activist, when I was a teenager in Birmingham through Dr. Roy Wood, who was a radio personality. And, and Angela Davis said, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things that I cannot accept. But either way, you look at it, whether you accept the things you cannot change, whether you change the things you cannot accept, God is still in charge. Michelle, because the reason is God sets high. God looks low, Linda. God plans, but God outplans man. Man rules, Leela, but God super rules due to the fact that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool, Kate. This is an unusual writing because John writes about the future as if the future is in the past. John had been exiled on the island of Patmos, 60 miles outside of the Aegean Sea. John had been punished for treason because in the Roman Empire, uh, he refused to honor a worldly king uh, because he, Deborah, 
believed that Jesus was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And in the Roman Empire, it was against the law to call anybody else king other than Domitian who ruled on the throne. But John came up out of a religious tradition, Franklin, which taught us to believe that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. And so John was wise enough to know that the power was not in the throne of Rome, but the power was in the throne of God. And the reason why we turn on each other so much, rather than turn to each other so little, Charlie, is because we have forgot where the power is, because we are no longer plugged in to the power source. In fact, sometimes we forget. We didn't get this far by ourselves. Uh, truly, uh, one of my mentors used to say, we didn't get this far because we were so good looking. We got this far because of God. It is God who brought us. God who taught us. God who kept us. And God who has never left us. And this is why David says, I will look towards the hills from which come in my help. My help come from the Lord who made the heavens and earth. And, 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 and John is talking about a war going on on the inside of us between right and wrong. He's not necessarily talking about eschatology or end things, but he's talking about a war going on inside of us between the devil and God, between heaven and hell, between right and wrong. And 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 and, and, and this is something that 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 plays out every day, twenty four hours of the day, Cindy. And in fact, the world comes to the end every day for somebody. The, the Bible is written in different kinds of literature, such as history, fable, saga, poetry, metaphors, allegory. Symbolies and symbols. And John is writing in simple but complex symbols. And he uses the dragon in his book of Revelations, like the book of Genesis used the serpent to show Satan. And it shows how Satan has grown from a serpent in the garden to a hideous dragon. In the beginning, the devil was just a snake. But the devil Ray is more powerful than he has ever been. And although the nature of the snake is still the same, the characteristics of the snake is like the devil. In fact, the snake can be where you least expect him. In fact, the snake blends in with his environment. The green snake travels in green grass. Coral snake hangs around sand and water moccasins hang around bark and water and rattlesnakes hide around rocks and the devil is like that he is where you least expect him and don't fool yourself the devil is not a little red man living under the ground that stabs people in the behind with a pitchfork that's a cartoon the devil that is outside of you is inside you or in somebody else's mind and almost every time, for example, you turn on the television, either day or night, uh, the television becomes the hell of vision because you see all types of sin, all times of the day and the night. You can see everybody's nasty behind on the television but your own. And when your cell phone turns into the hell phone, that is the devil. And have you noticed how the brain and your spinal cord looks like a, a snake, Cynthia, Cynthia uh, with a head at the top and curled down at the bottom. And you have in you what they call a reptilian brain, and the mind can be used for good or for evil. And John the Revelator is talking about the mind in man. And in the sixth chapter of the 
book of Revelation, John uses numbers, symbols, and colors. He uses the four horses of Revelations, as it is called, the pale horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the white horse. And he uses these horses to symbolize the way we go through life because horses was the major mode of transportation during John's time, much like cars is today. And you have a choice how you travel through life. The pale horse represents those who live for the flesh because the Bible says that death joys, death, death and hell follow thereafter. And that is because people, plants, and animals tend to turn pale before they die and after they die. He talks about the rider on the red horse, and the red horse represents the emotional nature in the human being. The sanctuary that I'm preaching in now has red carpet, represents emotionalism. Red is the color of fire, the color of blood. And when people are as black as I am, if we get angry, we'll turn red. Emotions are not enough to save anybody. It is not how high you jump or how loud you shout. It is what you do when you come back down. And I found that a lot of Sheldon Christians are no more than Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde Christians. They are holy in the church, but when they get back outside, they will turn back into that same old monster. And you just can't love the Lord with your, with your mind. You got to love the Lord with everything that you have, Ella. Because Jesus said, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Because your mind can lead you to condemn things before you examine things. And the only thing that will keep anybody in everlasting ignorance, Sheila, is condemnation before examination. In ancient times, in the mystery schools, which uh, the fraternities has evolved out of that came from the ancient Egyptian mystery school, they would find a wise man who wanted to be initiated into the mysteries, and they would break that wise man down by asking them, How, what did they know? And then once they told them what they knew, they would turn around and ask them what they don't know. And when you find out what you know in comparison to what you know, you will find out that you know next to nothing. And in fact, it's not about what you know. It's about what you show. That's why John associates the writer with scales in his hand in that sixth chapter of Revelation. And then he says uh, famine is associated with the writer because the mind will starve you spiritually. In fact, uh, when we look at the mind, no matter how intelligent that you are, you, you can't figure God out. This thing is not based on figuring. This thing is based on fact. That's why our ancestors were wise enough to pray, Lord, I come before you as an empty pitcher before a full fountain that never runs dry. But, 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 but John did not just stop at the pale horse. John did not just stop at the red horse. John did not just stop at the black horse. He said that the white horse went forth conquering the conqueror. And the white horse represents purity because the Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall sing God. That means those who put God first and foremost in their lives. That is why it's no accident that John breaks this book down into seven divisions with seven subdivisions when you intensively study this book. And I need to tell you that the number seven stands for God. And the word of God is built on the number seven. The Bible begins in the book of Genesis by saying in six days, God created the heavens and the earth but the seventh day was the Lord's day. In Leviticus, it talks about the seventh Sabbath. Noah took 
seven clean animals into his ark. Aaron and his sons could not be priests until they were consecrated after seven days. The priests had seven feasts. Solomon took seven years to build the holy temple in Jerusalem. Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho before they, be they came tumbling down. Joseph told Pharaoh's dream of seven fat cows and seven skinny cows and seven fat ears of corn and seven skinny ears of corn. Nor saw the rainbow sign which is seven color, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro William. The fire was heated seven times hotter than it had been heated before. And it is no accident that the book of Genesis begins the Bible by equating and associating the number seven with God, just like the book of Revelation totally closes the Bible, Dr. Wood, by associating the number seven with God. And in this book of Revelation, it gives us seven blessings, seven spirits, seven dooms, seven stars, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven churches. And Jesus himself spoke seven words on the cross. Ele, ele, la masa batani, my God, why hast thou for Sacred me, and I'm well aware all of y'all holy church folks don't know anything about shooting craps. But if you roll those craps and the first number that come up is the number seven, you win all of the money. And whether you know it or not, this game mean what this game means, if you throw down seven first, it's saying, seek ye first, Captain the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you, William. And, but if you throw any other number, every number means something. And that number seven catches up with you. God catch up with you. It means that you're through. It means what good is it to gain the whole world and turn around Patricia and lose your own soul, Barbara. And so I close with a story about the late, great Ralph David Abernathy, who was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s best friend. I met Dr. Ralph David Abernathy working with the late Reverend John Nettles, who was Alabama's SCLC president, became friends of Dr. Abernathy, and, and he interacted with leaders from Gaston, like the late, great Cutie Adams and Floyd Donner, Radio personality, and 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 and, and, and when I uh, attended seminary, Dr. Abernathy invited me to come and see him and talk with him, and I started going to visit Dr. Abernathy when I was matriculating at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. I would go to his house and visit with him periodically, and I loved to hear him talk about civil rights, especially the Birmingham movement. Sometimes I would take him shopping. Sometimes I would take him to speaking engagements. Sometimes we would go down to his church on Hunter Street, and I was blessed to introduce him in his last public speech to the ministers at the Interdenominational Theological Seminary, where I served as a student body president. And if you know anything about Dr. Abernathy, you know he always talked slow, acted slow, moved so he never got in a hurry. And on this day, when I was supposed to pick him up, he was late. I called him, told him I was on my way to his house. And when I got there, I blew my horn. He didn't come out. Blew my horn again. Did not, he did not come out. And so I got out my car and ran and jumped on Doc's porch. And he, when I jumped on the porch, a big dog came out of nowhere, acting ugly, and, 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 and finally quieted down, but kept his eyes on me, and I kept my eyes on the dog as I backed into the house. And I put Dr. Abernathy's coat on him, helped him get ready, and after we got to the school, 
to speak to the ministers before he ended his speech. He said, one reason I love Reverend Kelly so, he's not afraid. And he showed not afraid of dogs. He said, because this morning when he jumped on my porch, my dog supposed to have got him because my dog is a tech dog. He said, Reverend Kelly is not afraid of dog. And then Dr. Abernathy went on to talk about when him and the late great Reverend Dr. Fred Shuttlesworth and, 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 and Dr. Martin Luther King and the civil rights leaders in, 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 in Birmingham were fighting for justice in Project C. And the police had arrested my friend Gwen Sykes and thousands of Birmingham school children, high school children, and they had put high power fire hoses on them that were so powerful that it could knock the bark off of trees. They had beat some, and but when they got to the Birmingham, but when you go to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, you will see some statues in Kelly Ingram Park of some police struggling with dogs, and that is because when they tried to force those police dogs to bite Dr. Abernathy, Dr. King, Reverend Shuttlesworth, and the rest of the ministers. Dr. King told Dr. Abernathy, it's time to pray. And Dr. Abernathy and Dr. King and the preachers got down on their knees. And Dr. Abernathy started praying hard and loud. And the dogs got upset. The police kept trying to pull the dog back. But the dog started running away from them because that prayer drove those dogs crazy in Kelly Ingram Park, Keisha. Those four-legged dogs could no longer control those, those two-legged dogs could no longer control those four-legged dogs because God is still in charge. And I'm reminded of what you said and now unto him who is able to keep me from falling, and not just able, but able in a sick room, able in a hospital room, able on an operating table, able on a deathbed, able when you are unable, glory, able when you are disabled, and when you have finished your course, when you have kept the faith, when you have Run the race. He's able to keep you from falling down, from falling through, from falling back, from falling for something, from falling for nothing, from falling for anything to keep you from falling anytime, any place, and anywhere. So I stop by to tell you that in time like this, when we are in a pandemic, a physical illness, a pandemic, a mental and spiritual illness, a pandemic, a virus, a pandemic of a 400-year-old system of racism, which is the worst that the world has ever seen. I've stopped by to tell you today that God is the real seven up. He's still in charge. God was in charge yesterday. God is in charge today. God will be in charge tomorrow. God is in charge forevermore because he is the Alpha and the Maker. He was in the beginning, even before the beginning ever begun to begin. Somebody said he will see about his child. He will pick you up and turn you around, put your foot on solid ground. He will open doors that has been closed in your face. He will come and see about his child. God bless you. God bless you. Keep praying. Stay safe. And I love all of you.